Well, guys, it's an absolute pleasure. It's a bright, sunny morning here on Thursday here in Australia, but I'm speaking to one of the legendary bass guitarists from one of the big four of thrash metal. I'm talking to Dave Ellison, and I'm going to nickname him Junior. Good morning from Australia, David. Hey, how are you, Jamie? How are you doing, man? Good, man. And I've got to say, thanks for joining us. You're coming down to Australia for a speaking tour, and you also just released a biography book not long ago, actually. I have read it, and I'm going to ask, you're looking forward to coming down to Australia? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. It's been almost five years since I've been there, and I, I love Australia. I love the people. I just love the spirit. The spirit of Australia is very rock and roll. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's it's every beat, the, the country beats to its marches to its own beat, and uh, and has a, <laughs> it has a, a really cool and unique pulse, you know. So to come down there and and do the spoken word tour is great because there's a you know, there's just kind of like a real simple honesty to. Um, just the culture of uh, of Australia. You know, I've told so many people that over the years, you know, if I ever had to defect, I'd definitely move to Australia. <laughs> so I'm, glad I'm, I'm glad I'm coming down there and doing my spoken word with you guys. Yeah, and speaking of um, you coming to Australia for a speaking word tour, it's basically on the book that you just rela- released, My Life in Meth. I've got to ask, that was absolutely an outstanding autobiography. I mean, being in a band, I mega death, and not only that, being a former addict yourself. I'm a former addict myself. I've been clean for 15 years, but hearing right. the hearing the stories, especially around the time of the Rust and Peace album, I just want to ask: Was that really that dark for you? It was really dark. You know, the year of 1988 when we walked off stage with Castle Donington in England. 110,000 people, and then two days later, I'm sitting in a drug and alcohol rehab of the Van Nuys Hospital in California, um, really admitting to the world and, and to myself that uh, I'm a heroin addict, and um, I couldn't really quite fathom it and believe it because it was uh, it's that unbelievable moment where you admit that you're beat, but then your ego and everything else inside of you, your will to survive and the, you know, the will to fight comes out and says, I'm not beat. I'm out of here. You know? and then I, <laughs> so I went through a year and a half of three different rehabs and methadone clinics and all the different stuff, you know, to try to, to try to get clean. And, and, and to be honest with you, I didn't really even want to be clean. I just didn't want to be quite as strung out, you know? And, um, in that process of that year and a half is when I found out that I really was beat and that there is no middle ground, you know, that you can't, you know, for me, I couldn't, I couldn't have a little, if I had a little, I was going to have a lot. So it meant that I had to have none. And, um, you know, so at that moment was, was that, was that surrender. And that happened about a year later in November of 1989. Um, we did, you know, the rest of peace record was written. We went in and did a, a demo session at EMI Studios in, in Hollywood, um, and we demoed up those songs. And, um, you know, finally, funny, we had Chris Poland actually play some solos on those on those demos, which is me, Nick, and Dave. And then, you know, it was about, I don't know, maybe two months later, we, you know, we, we had one final guitar audition with a guy named Marty Friedman, you know, and he came in and, and really, you know, knocked it out of the park and he became the fourth member of Megadeth. And we went in the studio literally a month later and started recording the record, you know? So, um, you know, what, what happened between November of 89 and March one of 1990, as I went through the final process, this is of turning that corner to, to get sober, you know, and to get clean. And, um, you know, that's, um, has, it fortunately for me has stayed, it's stuck. You know, I've, I've been fortunate that I have not had to return back to, uh, to, you know, the active addiction and stuff. And, and that's, and it's, it's been great. So the good news is, is we made a hell of a record, you know, with rust and peace, um, because we wrote it, you know, and, in, 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 you know, completely out of our minds. And then we recorded it stone cold sober. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> You know, it's 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 a moment in time. You know, it's it's you know for anyone who's listening who's a 
you know, the addict and an alcoholic, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're lucky that we're able to create such great music in a dark place and actually get it on tape, you know, because that's not something you'd ever want to go back and do, you know, ever again. No. And just to see you come through the other side is just absolutely outstanding. I just want to ask, was the heroin and alcohol your main choice of drug? Yeah, you know, everything started with alcohol. Um, it started with, uh, at age 15, I grew up on a farm in Minnesota, a big grain farm, and you know, everything was uh, these big open dirt road, gravel roads. And, you know, so that was where it started one night when I was 15, drinking some peppermint schnapps, Southern Comfort, and some Miller beer, you know, and uh, which is an American beer. And, and, uh, and you know, drinking that, and, and uh, that set the cycle in motion, you know, and, you know, a few months, a couple of months later, I'm smoking marijuana, and a couple of years later, I'm snorting cocaine, and a couple of years after that, by the time I'm, I don't know, 19, 20 years old, I'm, I'm starting to snort and smoke heroin, and and um, those were the four horsemen, you know, yeah. you know, uh, uh, you know, pot, booze, smack, and coke. Those were the those were the four horsemen of my apocalypse, you know, and. Yeah. And so by the time I was 23, I was strung out to the bone and, and, you know, that started the, you know, the, 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 the slide, um, into the abyss. And so I'm, I'm lucky that by the time I was 25, I was able to get out of it, you know, and have remained out of it because, um, you know, a lot of people don't get out of it and especially to get out of it that young. Um, and then, you know, to, to, uh, like, but I think that's interesting is, you know, I got out of it. I was restored and through, you know, through the, the journey I speak of in my book, but, um, you know, what it really was is it's sort of like the good Lord hit the reset button for me. And, um, you know, I was restored back to, uh, who I was meant to be, you know, um, and, and the last 25 years of my life being clean have been the result of that, you know, be, be forthright, clear eyed, you know, wake up, eat good, take care of my body, take care of my, yeah, and uh, you you were you saying know, it allows me to. Yeah, you were saying yeah, that. It, it just a lot. Yeah, lo allows me to be the the bass player I was meant to be, the musician, the creative person I was meant to be. Um, you know, and and then the other part of that too is also to try to be helpful to people. You know, um, it's one thing to just get clean for your own selfish gain. Um, but it's, it's more important to be able to get clean and then be able to use your life to go be helpful to other people, you know? And, um, I know that that's going to be a part of this spoken word evening, you know, yeah. that, 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 this, this very thing you and me are talking about, in fact, you asked some very, um, some very poignant questions and thank you for these questions you asked, because as you can tell, I'm passionate about this topic. Yeah. Um, I can talk all night on just this. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, no, it, um, that's it, no, it, it, it that, is my life, you know? Yeah. That's no problem because I'm a former addict myself and also I'm a massive fan of metal and Megadeth have to be one in, in a few many of bands that I follow, and it's hand in hand. Here. This is just like a dream job for me, <laughs> so it's all good. But um, yeah. I've got to ask. Um, going through the process now, that there's been a lot of questions about who's in Megadeth and who's not in Megadeth. I'm not there to ask who's in, but the question I want to ask: if there was a golden ticket for a reunion to happen from Megadeth. What steps need to take place for that to happen? You know, here's the thing about reunions is, you know, everybody wants to try to relive this glory day um, because of what that period represented to them uh, through that music. Um, but you have to realize that, that it's a, it's, it's, it's greater than the sum of its parts. It isn't just the four people that recorded those songs. It was, it's what we just talked about it earlier in this interview, which is the darkness we were in. Um, and then the clarity that we had getting sober, um, and the people who were around us and, and you know, the, 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 that rest in peace record is, is a, is a story of a, of a journey. It's really what you're hearing. Um, you know, that's why none of the ever, you know, every record that we did with that lineup in particular, uh, had a different, 
you know, every album told a different story because we were in a different phase of our, of our lives, both as individuals and together, you know, and then there came this point where that lineup just stopped making music together. There, there was no more harmony. There was no more melody. There was no more music together. And that's why that lineup split up. Mm. So, you know, to think that, that somehow that's just going to all come back together um, you know, if it stopped working once, why would it ever work again? <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Um, you know, and you know, it, 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 you know, life moves forward, man. You know, life is a verb and it's always in action. And, and music is just a, a reflection of, of, of life, you know? And, and I, that's why I, I say that the next Megadeth record Whoever is going to be on it is, is has to has to be able to tell the story of Megadeth today in 2015. Whoever that may be, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, and and that, you know, uh, you know, is someone from the past, someone of the current day. That person has to be able to tell that story, and and that's why you know I, I know fans want to go. Do you believe me? I, me and Marty Friedman were second row to the Kiss reunion in 1996 when they played there in Phoenix, Arizona. You know, me and Marty were there together as friends, as bandmates, watching our favorite band put the makeup back on and present to us the 1996 version of Kiss Alive 2 that came out in like 1978 or 70, like 78, right? So 70, I know, you know, yeah, 77, and there's, there's a part of me that, that's, yeah, there's a part of me that said, you know, just lose yourself in the fantasy of being 14 years old all over again. You know what I mean? 13 years old. Yeah. And, and I did. And then there's the other part of me that I looked at him and I went, yeah, but now they're all like in their forties and you know, this is just, this is sort of a, just a recreation. There's nothing new being created here. This is just a recreation of past stuff. Yeah. Um, and you know, so I believe me, I had that personal experience, you know, there was the, there was the teenage fantasy and then there was the reality, you know, and, um, and, and, and it's the same with Megadeth, you know, there's this teenage fantasy of go back to recreate some yeah. glory day, uh, versus the reality, you know, so we can Megadeth in 2015, we can either go back and just recreate past glory days, which, you know, would probably sell a lot of tickets and we would probably make a lot of money. Yeah, that's it. But, Megadeth has never been about just going out and making a bunch of money. It no. has never been about that ever. So to us, it's about creatively telling the next, it's telling the, the, the next chapter of our story. It is. And that's what you get when you go in the studio together is you get to write and create your next chapter. Exactly. And that is where Megadeth is right now. Yeah. So, um, you know, that, that's, that really is the page turner right now. It is. I've got one last question. I'm very, very quick here because I'm running out of time. I only got 15 minutes. Megadeth was supposed to be yes. here last year for Soundwave. Were you disappointed that Megadeth couldn't come to Australia last year? Yes, very much. Very much disappointed. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, you know, look, again, I love Australia. I yep. love the people and always excited to get there anytime I can, you know. Uh, two, you know, Soundwave is the notorious big festival of uh, of Australia, you know, and we were on it and, and it was great. And, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, with sort of the, the transitions and changes and things that have happened. Hopefully that's no longer, you know, an issue and hopefully moving forward, all will be well. And Megadeth will be back down in Australia and, you know, um, who knows if, if maybe even on a sound wave. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't, I don't know about that. All I know is that, you know, in two weeks I am going there to Australia and, um, you know, so this is kind of almost one of these things where I take matters into my own hands, you know, and when the offer was put before to me to go to Australia, I graciously happily accepted immediately. I mean, it wasn't even, I didn't even have to second guess it and flinch at all. I was like, I'm there. Let's go. Well, guys, there you have it. Dave Ellison, he's coming to Australia very, very shortly. In a matter of 
weeks, probably a week and a half, he'll be here in Australia. And I've got to say, if you haven't got your tickets, please do so. Not only would Dave Ellison be here, but every state of the tour, you will have a support act in your local city. And meet and greets are available too. I'll be there in Adelaide. I'm seeing the man himself, Dave Ellison, and I've got to shake his hand because he is an inspiration not just to me, but to other people as well with his life story and his journey that he has taken on. And Dave, thank you for joining us, and we'll be talking very, very shortly when you get to Australia. Excellent. Thank you, Jamie. Thank Look you. Thanks, mate. Catch you later. Bye.